I'm going shopping in the village, George's mother said to George on Saturday morning. So be a good boy and don't get up to any mischief. Well, this was a silly thing to say to such a small boy at any time. It immediately made him wonder what sort of mischief he might get up to. And don't forget to give Grandma her medicine at eleven o'clock, the mother said. Then out she went, closing the back door behind her. Grandma, who was a dozing in her chair by the window, opened one wicked little eye and said, Now nah, you heard what your mother said, George. Don't forget my medicine. No, Grandma, George said. And just try to behave yourself for once while she's away. Yes, Grandma, George said. George was bored to tears. He didn't have a brother or a sister. His father was a farmer, and the farm they lived on was miles away from anywhere, so there were never any children to play with. He was tired of staring at pigs and hens and cows and sheep. He was especially tired of having to live in the same house as that grisly old grandion of a grandma. Looking after her all by himself was hardly the most exciting way to spend a Saturday morning. You can make me a nice cup of tea for a start, Grandma said to George. That'll keep you out of mischief for a few minutes. Yes, Grandma, George said. George couldn't help disliking Grandma. She was a selfish, grumpy old woman. She had a pale brown teeth and a small, puckered up mouth like a dog's bottom. How much sugar in your tea today, Grandma? George asked her. My spoon, she said. And no milk. Most grandmas are lovely, kind, helpful old ladies, but not this one. She spent all day and every day sitting in her chair by the window, and she was always complaining, growling, grouching, grumbling, griping about something or other. Never once, even on her best days, had she smiled at George and said, Oh, how are you this morning, George? Or, why don't you and I have a game of snakes and ladders? Or, how uh, was school today? She didn't seem to care about other people, only about herself. She was a miserable old grouch. George went into the kitchen and made Grandma a cup of tea with a tea bag. He put one spoon of sugar in it and no milk. He stirred the sugar well and carried the cup into the living room. Grandma sipped the tea. It's not sweet enough, she said. Put more sugar in. George took the cup back to the kitchen and added another spoonful of sugar. He stirred it again and carried it carefully into Grandma. Where's the saucer, she said. I won't have a cup without a saucer. George fetched her a saucer. And what about a teaspoon, if you please? Uh, I've stirred it for you, Grandma. I stirred it well. I'll stir my own tea, thank you very much. She said, fetch me a teaspoon. George fetched her a teaspoon. When George's mother or father were home, Grandma never ordered George about like this. It was only when she had him on her own and that she began treating him badly. You know, what's the matter with you? The old woman said, staring at George over the rim of the teacup with those bright, wicked little eyes. You're growing too fast. Boys who grow fast become stupid and lazy. But I can't help you from growing fast, Grandma, George said. Of course you can, she snapped. Growing's a nasty, childish habit. But we have to grow, Grandma. If we didn't grow, we'd never be grown-ups. Rubbish, boy, rubbish, she said. Look at me. Am I growing? Certainly not. But you did once, Grandma. Only very little, the old woman answered. I gave up growing when I was extremely small, along with the other nasty childish habits like laziness and disobedience and greed and sloppiness and untidiness and stupidity. You haven't given up any of these things, have you? I'm still only a little boy, Grandma. You're eight years old, she snorted. That's old enough to know better. If you don't stop growing soon, it'll be too late. Too late for what, Grandma? It's ridiculous, she went on. You're nearly as tall as me already. George took a good look at Grandma. She certainly was a very tiny person. Her legs were so short that she had to have a footstool to put her feet on, and her head only came halfway back up the armchair. Daddy said it's fine for a man to be tall, George said. Don't listen to your daddy, Grandma replied. Listen to me. 
But how do I stop myself from growing? George asked her. Eat this chocolate, Grandma said. Does chocolate make you grow? It makes you grow the wrong way, she snapped. Up instead of down. Grandma sipped some tea, but never took her eyes from the little boy who stood before her. Never grow up, she said. Always down. Yes, Grandma. And stop eating chocolate. Eat cabbage instead. Cabbage? Oh, no, I don't like cabbage, George said. It's not what you like or what you don't like, Grandma snapped. It's what's good for you that counts. From now on, you must eat cabbage three times a day. Mountains of cabbage. And if it's got caterpillars in it, it's so much the better. George said, caterpillars give you brains, the old woman said. Mummy washes them down the sink, George said. Mummy distributes you are, Grandma said. Cabbage doesn't taste of anything without a few boiled caterpillars in it. <gasps> slugs too. Not slugs, George cried out. I couldn't eat slugs. Whenever I see a live slug on a piece of lettuce, Grandma said. I gobbled it up quick before it goes away. Delicious. She squeezed her lips together tight so her mouth became a tiny wrinkled hole. Delicious, she said again. Worms and slugs and beetly bugs, you do know what's good for you. You're joking, Grandma. I never joke, she said. Beetles are perhaps best of all. They go crunch. What, Grandma, that's beastly. The old hag grinned showing those pale brown teeth. Sometimes, if you're lucky, she said, you get a beetle inside the stem of a stick of celery. That's what I like. Grandma, oh, how could you? You find all sorts of nice things in sticks of raw celery, the old woman went on. Sometimes it's earwigs. I don't want to hear about it, cried George. A big fat earwig is very tasty, Grandma said, licking her lips. But you've got to be very quick, my dear. When you put one of those in your mouth, it has a pair of sharp nippers on the back end. That if it grabs your tongue with those, it never lets go. So you've got to bite the earwig first. Chop, chop, before it bites you. George started edging towards the door. He wanted to get as far away as possible from this filthy old woman. You're trying to get away from me, aren't you? She said, pointing a finger straight at George's face. You're trying to get away from Grandma? Little George stood at the door, staring at the old hag in the chair. She stared back at him. Could it be, George wondered, that she was a witch? He had always thought witches were only in fairy tales, but now he was not so sure. Come closer to me, little boy, she said, beckoning to him with a horny finger. Come closer to me and I will tell you secrets. George didn't move. Grandma didn't move either. I know a great many secrets, she said, and suddenly she smiled. It was a thin, icy smile, the kind a snake might make just before it bites you. Can I even hear to Grandma, and she'll whisper secrets to you? George took a step backwards, edging closer to the door. You mustn't be frightened of your old grandma, she said, smiling that icy smile. George took another step backwards. Some of us, she said. And all at once, she was leaning forward in her chair and whispering a throaty sort of voice that George had never heard her use before. Some of us, she said. Magic powers that can twist the creatures of this earth into wondrous shapes. A tingle of electricity flashed down the end and length of George's spine. He began to feel frightened. Some of us, the old woman went on, have fire in our tongues and sparks in our bellies and wizardry in the tips of our fingers. Some of us know secrets that would make your hair stand straight up on end and your eyes pop out of their sockets. George wanted to run away, but his feet seemed stuck to the floor. We know how to make your nails drop off and teeth grow out of your fingers instead, 
George began to tremble. It was her face that frightened him the most. The frosty smile, the brilliant, unblinking eyes. We know how. You have to wake up in the morning with a long tail coming out from behind you. Grandma! He cried out. Stop! We know secrets, my dear. All about dark places where dark things live and squirm and slither and all over each other. George made a dive for the door. It doesn't matter how far you run, he heard her saying. You won't ever get away. George ran into the kitchen, slamming the door behind him. Chapter 2. The Marvellous Plan George sat himself down at the table in the kitchen. He was shaking a little. Oh, how he hated Grandma. He really hated that horrid old witchy woman. And all of a sudden, he had a tremendous urge to do something about her. Something whooping. Something absolutely terrific. A real shocker. A sort of explosion. He wanted to blow away the witchy smell that hung about her in the next room. He might have only been eight years old, but he was a brave little boy. He was ready to take this old woman on. I'm not going to be frightened by her, he said softly to himself. But he was frightened, and that's why he wanted suddenly to explode her away. Well, not quite away, but he did want to shake the old woman up a bit. Very well then. What would it be, this whooping, terrific, exploding shock of a grandma? He would have liked to put a firework banger under her chair, but he didn't have one. He would have liked to put a long green snake down the back of her dress, but he didn't have a long green snake. He would have liked to put six big black rats in her room with her and lock the door, but he didn't have six big black rats. As George sat there pondering this interesting problem, his eye fell upon the bottle of Grandma's brown medicine standing on the sideboard. What and stuff it seemed to be. Four times a day, a large spoonful of it was shoveled into her mouth and it didn't do her the slightest bit of good. She was always just as horrid after she'd had it as this she'd been before. The whole point of medicine, surely, was to make a positive person sorry, better. If it didn't do that, then it was quite useless. Ha! Ah! thought George suddenly. Ah! Oh! I know exactly what I'll do. I shall make her a new medicine. One that is so strong and so fierce and so fantastic, it will either cure her completely or blow the top of her head off. I'll make her a magic medicine. A medicine no doctor in the world has ever made before. George looked at the kitchen clock. It said five past ten. There was nearly an hour left before Grandma's next dose was due at eleven. Here we go then, cried George, jumping from the table. A magic medicine it shall be. <laughs> yes. So give me a bug and a jumping flea. Give me two snails and lizards, three. And a slimy squiggler from the sea. And a poisonous sting from a bumblebee. And the juice from the fruit of the juju tree. And the powdered bone of a wombat's knee. And one hundred other things as well. Each with a rather nasty smell. I'll stir them up, I'll boil them long. A mixture tough, a mixture strong. And then hi-ho, and down it goes. A big, nice spoonful. Hold your nose. Just gulp it down. Have no fear. How do you like it, Granny dear? Will she go pop? Will she explode? Will she go flying down the road? Will she go puff and then puff of magic smoke? Start fizzing like a can of coke? Who knows? Not I. Let's wait and see. I'm glad it's neither you nor me. Oh, Grandma, if you only knew what I have got in store for you. Chapter 3. George begins to make the medicine. George took out an enormous saucepan out of the cupboard and placed it onto the kitchen table. George! came the shrill voice from the next room. What are you doing? Nothing, Grandma, he called out. You needn't think I can hear you. Just because you closed the door, you're wrapped in the saucepans. I, I'm just tidying the kitchen, Grandma. Then there was silence. George had absolutely no doubts whatsoever about 
for how he was going to make his famous medicine. He wasn't going to fool about, wondering whether to put a little bit of this or a little bit of that. <laughs> Quite simply, he was going to put in everything he could find. There would be no messing about, no hesitating, no wondering whether a particular thing would knock the old girl sideways or not. The rule would be this. Whatever he saw, if it was runny or powdery or gooey, in it went. Nobody had ever made a medicine like that before. If it didn't actually cure Grandma, then it would anyway. But it would cause some exciting results. It would be worth watching. George decided to work his way round the various rooms one at a time and see what they had to offer. He would go to the bathroom first. There were always lots of funny things in the bathroom. So upstairs he went, carrying the enormous two-handed saucepan before him. In the bathroom he gazed longingly at the famous and dreaded medicine cupboard, but he didn't go near it. It was the only one thing in the entire house that he was forbidden to touch. He had made solemn promises to his parents about that, and he wasn't going to break them. There were things in there, they had told him, that could actually kill a person. And although he wanted, he was out to give Grandma a pretty fiery mouthful, he didn't really want a dead body on his hands. George put the saucepan on the floor and went to work. Number one was a bottle labelled Golden Gloss Hair Shampoo. He emptied it into the pan. <laughs> that ought to wash her tummy nice and clean, he said. He took a full tube of toothpaste and squeezed out the whole lot of it in one long worm. Hmm. Maybe that'll brighten up those horrid brown teeth of hers, he said. There was an aerosol can of super foam shaving soap belonging to his father. George loved playing with aerosols. He pressed the button and kept his finger on it until there was nothing left. A wonderful mountain of white foam built up in the giant saucepan. With his fingers, he scooped out the contents of a jar of vitamin-enriched face cream. In went a small bottle of scarlet nail varnish. If the toothpaste doesn't clean her teeth, George said, then this will paint them as red as vases. He found another jar of creamy stuff labelled hair remover. Smear it on your legs, it said, and allow it to remain for five minutes. George tipped it all into the saucepan. There was a bottle of yellow stuff inside called Ditchworth's Famous Dandruff Cure. In it went. There was something else called Brilliant for Cleaning False Teeth. It was a white powder. In that went too. He found another aerosol can. Never more ponking deodorant spray. Guaranteed, it said, to keep away unpleasant body smells for a whole day. Hmm. She could use plenty of that, George said as he sprayed the entire can full into the saucepan. Liquid paraffin, the next one was called. It was a big bottle. He hadn't fancy the faintest idea what it did to you, but he poured it in anyway. That he thought, looking around him, was about all from the bathroom. On his mother's dressing table in the bedroom, George found yet another lovely aerosol can. It was called Helga's Hair Set. Hold 12 inches away from the hair and spray lightly. He squirted the whole lot into the saucepan. <laughs> he did enjoy squirting those aerosols. There was a bottle of perfume called Flowers of Turnips. It smelled of old cheese. In it went. And in... Two, went a large round box of powder. It was called Pink Plaster. There was a powder puff on top. Eh, and he threw that in as well, for luck. He found a couple of lipsticks. He pulled the greasy red things out of their little cases and added them to the mixture. The bedroom had nothing more to offer, so George carried the enormous saucepan downstairs again and trotted off to, into the laundry room, where the shelves were full of all kinds of household items. The first one he took down was a large box of super white for automatic washing machines. Dirt will disappear like magic. George didn't know whether Grandma was automatic or not, but she certainly was a dirty old woman. Hmm, she'd better have it all, he said, tipping in the whole box full. 
Then there was a big tin of Maxwell floor polish. It removes filth and foul messes from your floor and leaves everything shiny bright, it said. George scooped the orange-coloured waxy stuff out of the tin and plonked it into the pan. There was a round cardboard carton labelled Flea Powder for Dogs. Keep well away from the dog's food, it said, because this powder, if eaten, will make the dog explode. Good, said George, pouring it into the saucepan. He found a box of canary seed on the shelf. "Eh, Perhaps it'll make the old bird sing, he said, and in it went. Next, George explored the box with shoe cleaning materials, brushes and tins and dusters. Well now, he thought, Grandma's medicine is brown, so my medicine must also be brown, or she'll smell that. The way to colour it, he decided, would be with brown shoe polish. The large tin he chose was labelled Dark Tan. Splendid. He scooped it all out with an old spoon and plopped it into the pan. He would stir it up later. On his way back to the kitchen, George saw a bottle of gin standing on a sideboard. Hmm, Grandma was very fond of gin. She was allowed to have a small nip of it every evening. Now he would give her a treat. (laughs) He would pour the whole bottle. He did. Back in the kitchen, George put the huge saucepan on the table and went over to the cupboard that served as a larder. The shelves were bulging with bottles and jars of every sort. He chose the following and emptied them one by one into the saucepan. A tin of curry powder, a tin of mustard powder, a bottle of extra hot chilli sauce, a tin of black peppercorns, a bottle of horseradish sauce. There! He said out loud. That should do it. George! Came a screechy voice from the next room. Who are you talking to in there? What are you up to? Uh, uh, nothing, Grandma. Absolutely nothing, he called back. Is it time for my medicine yet? No, Grandma. Not for about half an hour. Well, just so you don't forget it. (laughs) I won't, Grandma, George answered. I promise I won't. Chapter 4. Animal Pills At this point, George suddenly had an extra good wheeze. Although the medicine cupboard in the house was forbidden ground, what about the medicines his father kept on the shelf in the shed next to the hen house? The animal medicines. What about those? Nobody had ever told him he mustn't touch them. Let's face it, George said to himself, hairspray and shaving cream and shoe polish are all very well, and they will no doubt cause some splendid explosions inside the old geezer, but what? Uh, the magic mixture needs now is a touch of the real stuff. Real pills and real tonics to give it punch and muscle. George picked up the heavy three-quarters full saucepan and carried it out of the back door. He crossed the farmyard and headed straight for the shed alongside the henhouse. He knew his father wouldn't be there. He was out haymaking in one of the meadows. George entered the dusty old shed and put the saucepan on the bench. Then he looked up at the medicine shelf. There were five big bottles there. Two were full of pills, two were full of runny stuff, and one was full of powder. I'll use them all, George said. Grandma needs them. Boy, does she need them. The first bottle he took down contained an orange-coloured powder. The label said, Four chickens with foul pest, hen gripe, sore beaks, scammy legs, cockerelitis, egg trouble, broodiness, or loss of feathers. Mix one spoonful only with each bucket of feed. Well, George said aloud to himself as he tipped the whole bottle for him. The old bird won't be losing any feathers after she's had a taste of this. The next bottle he took down had about 500 gigantic purple pills in it. For horses with horse throats, it said on the label. The horse-throated horse should suck one pill twice a day. Grandma may not have horse throat, George said, but she's certainly got a sharp tongue. Maybe uh, they'll cure that instead. Into the saucepan went the 500 gigantic purple pills. Then there was a bottle of thick yellowish liquid for cows, bulls and bollocks. The label said, we'll cure cowpox, cow mange, crumpled horns, bad breath in bulls, earache, toothache, headache, hoofache, 
tail out and saw adders. <laughs> that grumpy old cow in the living room has every one of those illnesses, George said. She will need it all. With a slop and a gurgle, the yellow liquid, yellow liquid splashed into the now nearly full saucepan. The next bottle contained a bright, brilliant red liquid. Sheep dip, it said on the label, for sheeps with sheep rot. And for getting rid of ticks and fleas, mix one spoonful in one gallon of water and slosh it over the sheep. Caution, do not make the mixture any stronger or the wool will fall out and the animal will be naked. My gum, George said. How I'd love to walk in and slosh it all over Grandma and watch the ticks and fleas go jumping off her. But I can't. I mustn't. So she'll have to drink it instead. He poured the bright red medicine into the saucepan. The last bottle on the shelf was a full of pale green pills. Pig pills, the label announced. For pigs with pork prickles, tender trotters, bright bristle blight and swine sickness. Give one pill a day. In severe cases, two pills may be given. But more than that will make the pig rock and roll. (laughs) Just the stuff, said George, for that miserable old pig there in that house. She'll need a very big dose. He tipped all the green pills, hundreds and hundreds of them, into the saucepan. There was an old stick lying on the bench that had been used for stirring paint. George picked it up and started to stir his marvellous concoction. The mixture was as thick, as creamy, as he had stirred and stirred. And as he stirred and stirred, many wonderful colours rose up from the depths and blended together. Pinks, blues, greens, yellows and browns. George went on staring until it was all well mixed. But even so, there were still hundreds of pills lying on the bottom that hadn't melted. Hmm. And there was his mother's splendid powder puff floating on the surface. I shall have to boil it up, George said. One good quick boil on the stove is all it needs. And with that, he staggered back towards the house with the enormous heavy saucepan. On the way, he passed the garage so that he went. So he went in to see if he could find any other interesting things. He added the following. Half a pint of engine oil to keep the yet grandma's engine running smoothly. Some antifreeze to keep her radiator from freezing up in winter. A handful of grease to grease her creaking joints. (laughs) Then back to the kitchen. Chapter 5. The Cook-Up. In the kitchen, George put the saucepan on the stove and turned the gas gas flame up underneath it as high as it would go. George! Came the awful voice from the next room. It's time for my medicine! Not yet. Grandma, George called back. There's still 20 minutes before 11 o'clock. Well, what mystery for you up to now? Granny screeched. I hear noises. George thought it best not to answer that one. He found a long wooden spoon in the kitchen drawer and began stirring hard. The stuff in the pot got hotter and hotter. Soon the marvellous mixture began to froth and foam. A rich blue smoke, the colour of peacocks, rose from the surface of the liquid and a fiery, fearsome smell filled the kitchen. It made jaw choke and splutter. Mm, It was a smell unlike any he had smelled before. It was a brutal and bewitching smell, spicy and staggering, fierce and frenzied, full of wizardry and magic. Whenever he got a whiff, of it up his nose, firecrackers went off in his skull, and electric prickles ran along the back of his legs. It was wonderful to stand there, stirring this amazing mixture, and to watch it smoking blue and bubbling and frothing and foaming as though it was alive. At one point, he could have sworn he saw bright sparks flashing in the swirling foam. And suddenly, George found himself dancing around the steaming pot, chanting strange words that came into his head out of nowhere. (laughs) Fiery broth and witches brew, foamy froth and riches blue, fume and spume and spoon drift spray, fizzle, swizzle, shout hooray, watch it sloshing, swashing, sploshing, hear it hissing, squishing, spissing, 
grandma better start to pray. Chapter 6. Brown Paint George turned off the heat under the saucepan. He must leave plenty of time for it to cool down. When all the steam of froth had gone away, he peered into the giant pan to see what colour the great medicine now was. <laughs> it was deep and brilliant blue. Hmm, it needs more brown in it, George said. It simply must be brown or she's going to get suspicious. George ran outside and dashed into his father's tool shed where all the paints were kept. There was a row of cans on the shelf, all colours, black, green, red, pink, white and brown. He reached for the can of brown. Label said simply, dark brown gloss paint, one quart. He took a screwdriver and prized off the lid. The can was three quarters full. He rushed it back to the kitchen. He poured the whole lot into the saucepan. The saucepan was now full to the brim. Very gently, George stirred the paint into the mixture with the long wooden spoon. Aha! It was turning brown. A lovely, rich, creamy brown. Where's that medicine of mine, boy? came the voice from the living room. You're forgetting about me. You're doing it on purpose. I shall tell your mother. I'm not forgetting you, Grandma, George called back. I'm thinking of you all the time. Uh, but there are still ten minutes to go. You naughty little maggot! The voice screamed back. You're a lazy and disobedient little worm, and you're growing too fast. George fetched the bottle of Grandma's real medicine from the sideboard. He took out the cork and tipped it down the sink. He then filled the bottle with his own magic mixture by dipping a small jug into the saucepan and using it as a pourer. He replaced the cork. Had it cooled down enough yet? Hmm. Not quite. He held the bottle under a cold tap for a couple of minutes. The label came off in the wet, but that didn't matter. He dried the bottle with the dishwash, a dishcloth. All was now ready. This was it. The great moment had arrived. Medicine time, Grandma! He called out. I should hope so too, came the grumpy reply. The silver tea tablespoon in which the medicine was already given lay ready on the kitchen sideboard. George picked it up. Holding the spoon in one hand and the bottle in the other, he advanced into the living room. Chapter 7 will be on the next upload. Now, before I continue or finish, sorry, um, a warning to readers at the beginning of this book. Do not try to make George's Marvellous Medicine yourselves at home. It could be dangerous. This is fiction. <laughs>